Notre Dame's hot streak rolls on as the Irish picked up two more very important players in the transfer portal and two of their best defensive players announced that they are coming back for next season. That's coming right up. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up? Welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Friday, December 15th, so happy Friday, and thank you for getting your day started right here by making this your first listen of the day. My name is Tyler Wojak, and I'm the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Since it's Friday, we'll be doing another mailbag on today's show. But before we get to the questions, I wanted to talk more about some really good news coming out of South Bend this week as Notre Dame picked up two more commitments in the transfer portal over the past couple of days. Plus, Jack Kaiser and Riley Mills announced that they will be back for the 2024 season. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Xavier Watts and Joe Walt, who became the 35th and 36th uh, unanimous All-American selections in the storied history of Notre Dame football. It is an unbelievable accomplishment and well-deserved for both of those guys for just having an incredible season in 2023. But since we're on the topic, Joe Walt did officially announce that he's entering his name in the NFL draft, as did Cam Hart and and Audric Estime in recent days. Even though that's not good news for the Irish, which kind of goes against what I said off the top of this show, but it's not a surprise at all. We all knew this was coming for months, and I've talked about it on the show a bunch, so I don't think we need to do a deep dive on that other than to say those three did so much for this team and this university, and I wish them the best of luck at the next level. Audric Estime, especially, man, he is going to go down as one of my all-time favorite players to watch in the blue and gold, and I think he's going to have a great career at the next level. Same with Cam Hart and Joe Walt. But let's talk about who Notre Dame is getting in their latest transfer portal edition. So on Wednesday... Former Duke defensive end R.J. Oban announced his commitment to play for Notre Dame in his sixth and final year of eligibility. And then on Thursday, former South Carolina kicker Mitch Jeter committed to Notre Dame as a graduate transfer. Both of these players were top priorities by the staff, and I think you can make the case that each of them is one of, if not the best player at their position, uh, respectively, available in this transfer portal cycle. Let's talk about R.J. Oban. He is the second former Duke player to commit to Notre Dame this week, the first being quarterback Riley Leonard. And Oban is a six foot four, 260-pound edge rusher who visited Notre Dame last weekend, and that was enough to lock him into his commitment, despite the fact that he had planned a visit to Florida State this upcoming weekend. And this is a big win for Notre Dame on the field, but it's also... Nice to get one back from Florida State because Notre Dame lost out on defensive lineman Braden Fisk to the Seminoles last year, and Fisk was uh, just a game wrecker uh, on their defensive line, especially in that ACC championship game. So that was a miss, but now Notre Dame got Oban away from Florida State. In 2023, Oban had 17 tackles, six tackles for loss, five sacks, and a pass deflected. And then during the two previous seasons, he had a combined 45 tackles with 13 and a half TFLs. Nine and a half sacks, four forced fumbles, and an interception. This dude can flat out get after the quarterback. According to Pro Football Focus, Oban registered 64 quarterback pressures over the past two seasons, including two against Notre Dame this past season. He was given Blake Fisher uh, a ton of problems in that one. And he's actually projected to play strong side end in place of Javante Jean-Baptiste for the Irish next year. So he certainly has big shoes to fill considering uh, how well JJB played this past year. And if you think about it, their profiles are pretty similar at the time of their transfer to Notre Dame because uh, Javante Jean-Baptiste was looked at as, as a pure pass rusher when he came to Notre Dame, and that's really because that's what he was asked to do at Ohio State. He was not considered great against the run, but when he played for Notre Dame, he was very effective against the run and the pass, and that's a big reason why he finished fourth on the team in tackles with 47 last season. Al Washington is a big part of that. He deserves a ton of credit for what he was able to do with Javante Jean-Baptiste. And Al Washington is basically going to have to replicate that development with Oban because if you look at Oban's stats from Duke, they, they aren't great against the run, to be honest with you. He only had 17 total tackles, which was 19th on the team last year for the Blue Devils. And he only had nine run stops, which the way uh, pro football focus phrases it, it's a tackle at or near the line of scrimmage, which constitutes a failure for the offense. 
That was also tied for 19th on the team last year. So that's definitely something he's going to have to work on because right now we don't really know who his backup is going to be at the strong side end position. I thought it would be Nana Osafa Mensa, but the staff told him to move on. Now he is at TCU. But that being said, I'm really, really excited about what he brings to the table. He's so good at getting after the quarterback. Plus, now that Mills is coming back and with Cross in tow as well, this is the potential to be a really, really good defensive line unit next year. Now let's talk about Mitch Jeter, the kicker. For the third year in a row, Notre Dame added a grad transfer kicker out of the transfer portal, and I think that will be the plan until the end of time, basically. And and it makes sense, right? You want to get a kicker who has experience, especially kicking in big-time stadiums, and Mitch Jeter certainly has that playing in the SEC. Last season, Jeter was 12 of 14 on field goal attempts with a long of 51, and both of his misses were 50 yards or more. The year prior to that, he was a perfect 11 of 11 on field goal attempts, including two of 50 yards. So if you look at his last two years combined, he's gone 23 of 25. That is deadly accurate. And even though he doesn't have as strong of a leg as Spencer Schrader does, that's fine, right? Like personally, I would prefer the more accurate option because I, I just think it it brings a sense of calmness and, and you just have more trust in the kicker. Like as exciting as it was to watch Spencer Schrader come out there and try to kick a 56 yarder, it was not as fun when he'd come in to kick the 35 yard chip shot and you're like, is he going to make this? I have no idea. It could end up in, you know, the opposing student section or something like that because he could be that erratic, or at least he was until the second half of the season. Oddly enough, Mitch Jeter has missed, has missed three extra points in his career, which is kind of surprising given how accurate he is kicking field goals. Um, I am not sure if he's going to handle the kickoff duties for Notre Dame next season. He did while he was at South Carolina, but uh, I know that his touchback percentage was on the lower end, and Notre Dame does have other options. They have Zach Yoakum, walk-on kicker. He handled the kickoff duties two years ago before Spencer Schrader came in. They're like, hey, we got this one with him. Um, Or they might let the punter, Bryce McPherson, give another shot at it. Um, He was actually projected to be the kickoff guy two years ago, but then I think he suffered an injury and was not even really in the mix for it this past year. So maybe they give him another shot or maybe they let Jeter just do it because he has done it before. Either way, I think this is a great addition for the Irish because uh, you need to have a reliable kicker. Like look what Brandon Aubrey, the former Notre Dame soccer player, is doing for the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, He's been such a weapon for them all all season long. And it is kind of crazy that maybe the best kicker to ever come through Notre Dame didn't even play for the football team, but that is a story for another day. Either way, having a kicker that you can trust uh, is great for the team, and I think Mitch Jeter might be the best transfer portal kicker Notre Dame has gotten so far. All right, let's talk about the guys currently on the roster who are going to be back on the team next season. Riley Mills and Jack Kaiser, they both announced that they're going to return to the Irish next season, and that is major, major news for the Irish defense. Last season, Riley Mills racked up 45 total tackles, which was six on the team, Plus, he added five and a half DFLs and two and a half sacks, plus two fumble recoveries. He did have a slow start to the year, but then, man, he really turned it on. Uh, I think it was like around October, and he was such a force on the interior the rest of the way. His measurables are off the charts. He's been on Bruce Feldman's freaks list two years in a row. So to be honest with you, I expected him to go to the NFL. I know that after last season, uh, after the 2022 season, he put in uh, or he requested an NFL evaluation, didn't like the results he got, so he decided to come back. So I sort of interpreted that as the guy wanted to play at the next level. But um, I think he did get an evaluation again and decided to come back to Notre Dame, and that is great news for the Irish defense because now they have two defensive tackles who both could be playing in the NFL next season, but they elected to come back, and that is going to be a big problem for opposing offensive lines, and I I don't envy those guys. Um, As for Jack Kaiser, he was third on the team in tackles last season with 59, despite being 12th on the defense in snaps with 327. He is a very, very productive player when he's on the field. Unfortunately for him, he had to come off the field a lot because he played the rover position, and when the nickel comes in, which is basically Notre Dame's space defense, the rover comes out, and he was playing alongside two other very good linebackers in Maris Leofau and J.D. Bertrand. I would expect that Kaiser moves inside full-time so that Notre Dame never really has to take him off the field next season. I know that he had to do that a little bit this past season, but I think that's going to be the full-time switch for him, and I think that'd be great because not only is he a really productive player when he's on the field, I think he's going to be a huge asset for the rest of the defense because he's been around for so long and he knows the system, and he's going to be playing with some really young guys at linebacker, which Notre Dame hasn't had to do in a long time. Like, 
Uh, Drake Bowen is going to be getting a lot of time. Jane Osbury, even Jalen Sneed, who will be a junior. He's pretty inexperienced as well. Maybe even Kingston Viliamu Asa as a true freshman might get on the field. So having a veteran like Jack Kaiser in the mix there at linebacker really helps them because he can make sure that they're in the right place before the play. And then I have all the confidence in the world that he's going to be a really, really productive linebacker, um, playing a lot more snaps for the Irish next season. But now that Kaiser's coming back and now that we know Mills is coming back, I think this is a college football playoff level defense. Like they could be one of the best defenses in the entire country. They are solid at every single level. Now we're still waiting on word from Xavier Watts about whether or not he's going to come back, but it does seem like right now he's favoring coming back to Notre Dame. And that would give you NFL players at every single level of the defense. Actually, I don't know if Jack Kaiser is NFL caliber just yet, but it gives you two on the defensive line at least, plus R.J. Oban, and then a very experienced linebacker in Jack Kaiser. We know Benjamin Morrison is a future NFL player, and uh, Xavier Watts at the back end as well. That is that is a really, really good defense. And, uh, hey, as long as Notre Dame is able to retain Al Golden, I think that they're safe for now. Once the NFL season ends, hopefully no teams are calling about him becoming the defensive coordinator but I think the fact that Notre Dame's defense has this many guys coming back is going to make it um, really hard for Al Golden to want to leave because this group could be really special next season after having a phenomenal year this past year. All right, coming up next, it's time for the mailbag. But I want to give a quick note that if you're watching on YouTube, you might notice a stark change in lighting. That's because I actually taped this entire show earlier on Thursday and then the SMA news came out and the Mills news came out. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to retape the open so that this show is not outdated. So I just wanted to throw that out there, but let's get to the mailbag. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With great deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you could stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all of the fun you're going to have. If you plan on attending the Sun Bowl in a couple weeks and are still in need of a ticket, Game Time is the perfect place for you. It is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason, and you can get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You can buy tickets in a matter of seconds, just two taps, and your set and the tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email snag the tickets without the stress with game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on college for twenty dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code locked on college for twenty dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed one last thing before we get to the questions, please take a moment to like the video below and subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast, please rate the show five stars, leave a review, and of course, subscribe. Okay, this next question, or should I say three questions, all concerns about the offensive line. Our Fritz Forty asks, what do you believe the offensive line looks like next season? Should we be worried? And then Coroni Tony, what's the 2024 offensive line going to look like? Tackles could be a problem in my opinion. And then third, I think this is Stain KD. I'm sorry if I'm spelling that wrong or pronouncing that the wrong way. Um, are you worried about the offensive line next year? So my hunch is that a lot of you are worried about the offensive line next season, and I get it. Uh, the only full-time returning starter next season is Pat Coogan. We expect Rocco Spindler to be ready to go by next season, although he is recovering from knee surgery. I think he's going to be ready to play in spring practice, but who even knows if he's going to be a starter on the team next season because he's likely going to be in a battle with Billy Shroud. So here's what I expect the offensive line to look like next year. At left tackle, we're going to see Tosh Baker, probably, fifth-year senior. Left guard, Pat Coogan, starter this season. And then at center, Ashton Craig, who started the last two games in place of an injured Z Carell and is basically the reason they told Z Carell to move on because they are so high on Ashton Craig. So that's encouraging. At right guard, I think it's going to be a battle between Rocco Spindler and Billy Shrouth. Whoever wins that um, is going to be the starter. And then at right tackle, Emil Wagner. So basically... This offensive line with Billy Shrouth at right guard is going to be what we see in the Sun Bowl. So it's going to be like a rehearsal. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Oregon State has a bunch of opt-outs. So theoretically, Notre Dame's offensive line should perform pretty well. But I think most of their pass rushers are going to be playing in this game. So it's going to be a good test for the Notre Dame offensive line. Am I worried? Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm a little bit worried because Notre Dame will be breaking in two new offensive tackles, and the last time they had to do that was 2021, and we all saw what happened there. That year, they started Blake Fisher at left tackle to start the year, and then he got hurt, and then I guess the good thing that came out of that was we got to see what Joe Walt could do when he was actually the third left tackle to play for Notre Dame that season, because Tosh Baker had a start. Um, it didn't go that great for him, and then he got hurt. Joe Walt came in, and then he never gave that up. 
can we expect Tosh Baker or Emil Wagner to be the next Joe Alt? I don't think so. That's probably not fair to them. So I am worried about the inexperience. Obviously, the more experience, the better at any position, but particularly the offensive line, especially when you get the unit playing together. These guys haven't played a ton together, especially all as one unit up to this, mo- up, up to this point. So it's definitely going to be a concern. I, I'm guessing that we're going to be talking about this a lot throughout the offseason because Notre Dame, as Marcus Freeman has said many times before, needs to be a program driven by its offensive and defensive line. The best teams in the country, they're going to be great at the skill positions, but they are always going to be great um, in the trenches, and you really, really need a good offensive line for any team, but specifically Notre Dame. Now, I am hopeful that Notre Dame will add uh, a starting tackle in the transfer portal. I have not heard any names up to this point. Maybe they're going to wait their time and get the right guy. Uh, just because they don't get a guy in this cycle doesn't mean they can't add another one in the spring. That's actually when they added Kane Madden a couple years ago, although that experiment really didn't work out. So hopefully if they do end up adding an offensive lineman in the transfer portal, he is better than Kane Madden, even though Madden ended up starting pretty much every game while he was at Notre Dame. So yes, it is a concern. I think it's a concern for the coaching staff as well. So I think they're going to be aggressive in the portal, but it does feel a little bit premature to start really worrying about this. I mean, you look at these guys Every single one of them was a top recruit coming out of high school. So it's not like they're not talented. They just don't have a lot of experience. So until we see them on the field playing well, it's probably going to be a concern that we talk about for the next several months. Okay, next question. Another uh, combined question. And Josh H., why aren't you a believer in Steve Angeli? He's looked good every time he's been on the field, including the spring games. And then Irish fan 81. What happens if Angeli balls out in the bowl game and has a stellar spring slash summer camp? Okay, it's not that I don't like Steve Angeli, and I I don't think he could eventually be a a good college quarterback. It's like I'm saying, it's not you, it's me. Well, I guess it is you, because I don't believe in Steve Angeli as the starting quarterback for Notre Dame long-term because it doesn't seem like the Notre Dame coaching staff believes in him as the long-term option. If they did, they wouldn't have pursued Riley Leonard in the transfer portal as aggressively as they did. And and yes, Steve Angeli has looked really good in limited action, but it's against bad teams, and it's, uh, it's happening when the game is already well in hand. So it's an extremely small sample size against bad competition, and I'd venture to say that if you had any good quarterback play in that circumstance, they're probably going to look pretty good if they are a good quarterback. Now, if they don't, then that's a pretty good sign that, hey, maybe this isn't the guy. So I look at it from the standpoint of the coaches, right? Like I only see what I can see from Steve Angeli, and that's on Saturdays. The coaching staff sees Angeli every single day for hours upon hours, and they clearly don't think that he is the best option for Notre Dame next year. And I know that Marcus Freeman has said in press conferences that he still has trust in Angeli and Minchie. That's that's what he's supposed to say, right? He's trying to keep them on the team next year so that Riley Leonard's backups are, are quality options. Like, I don't think he's a bad player. I just don't think he's a very talented quarterback that is going to get Notre Dame to where they want to be. Um, we see this all the time when fans who see very limited action from players, they want to see that player on the field more. Way more often than not, there is a reason why that player isn't on the field. Jordan Johnson, the former wide receiver who then went to UCF, who I think is at some JUCO now, he is like the prime example of this, right? Every fan on the message boards was like, why isn't Jordan Johnson playing? Why isn't Jordan Johnson playing? He was the high four-star recruit, top five wide receiver in the country that Notre Dame was able to get. It was a huge recruit. And guess what? He was terrible right? He didn't even have a single catch when he was at UCF. And the reason that Notre Dame staff wasn't playing him was because he wasn't good, despite the fact that he was a highly rated recruit. I'm not saying that Steve Angeli is like Jordan Johnson. I'm just saying that there is a reason why the coaching staff went out and got someone else, because they think that player is better. And I trust the coach's opinion about their players, the guys who they see every single day, way more than the people on message boards. So if even if Angeli does go out, and he, he has a great game against Oregon State, that would certainly be great for his confidence, but it just doesn't mean that much in the long term because Oregon State is basically going to be playing their second-team defense, and Notre Dame has already made their decision on the quarterback. Now, if Angeli has a great spring and a great summer, that would be great because I, I think the best case for Notre Dame is that he sticks around and gives Riley Leonard a serious run for his money. Um, that would be the best-case scenario because then – 
whoever's better of the two is going to be the starting quarterback. And we already know that Riley Leonard is a good quarterback with a ton of potential. And if Steve Angeli is able to prove that he's better than him on the practice field, then that's great. I just don't think that's very likely. And I don't think the coaching staff sees that as, as a very likely option either. But it is the best case scenario. Again, it sounds like I'm being really harsh on Angeli. I really like what he's done for Notre Dame so far. I just think that the uh, – the, some people, the way that they view him as he as this next great option and that Notre Dame is just doing him a disservice, like they already know the answer. They're with him every day. We barely get to see him. All right, we've got a couple more questions left, including one that I love, and uh, we're going to create the perfect bowl game coming up next. This episode of Locked On Irish is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a skill based, real money daily fantasy sports game. You've heard me talk about Prize Picks before, and I have had so much fun playing it during the football season, and now you can play during basketball season as well. All you have to do is select two or more players and pick more or less than their projected stats and place your entry. PrizePix even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and is not returned in the second, that player is rebooted. PrizePix is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy, and that's just one of the reasons why I think it's the best daily fantasy sports game out there. Go to PrizePix.com slash LockedOnCollege and use code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That's pricepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Price picks daily fantasy sports made easy. Okay, we've got two more questions left, and this next one comes from Frank Sarah. Who do you think Notre Dame will land next in the transfer portal? I don't think that there are any more like sure thing commitments at this point. I think those have all committed by now. Um, the Oban and Jeter commitments we kind of all saw coming all week long. So at this point in time, I don't think there's a silent commitment or anything out there, but former Wake Forest wide receiver Jamal Banks is actually going to be on campus this weekend. That was reported by Tom Loy of 24-7 Sports. So I guess he would be the safest bet, although Notre Dame already has two wide receivers in the transfer portal and former FIU wide receiver Chris Mitchell, former Clemson wide receiver Bo Collins. So I don't know if this is like as much of a guaranteed take as those other guys, but I think he should be because Banks is a big dude. He's six foot four, 205 pounds. And then last season for the Demon Deacons, he registered 59 receptions, 653 receiving yards and four touchdowns. So you add another guy like that, that's more experienced, that's more production in the room. And uh, I feel like that would be great for the Irish heading into next season. But Jamal Banks is a really good prospect or he's not a prospect. He's a really good player uh, who's going to be getting a lot of attention from some big-time programs. But I think that would be great if Notre Dame were to land him because that would be their third new wide receiver in the transfer portal. And then I, they'd have 10 scholarship receivers for next season, and I think that they would be set at the position despite the, max, uh, the mass exodus that occurred a couple weeks ago. So if you look at it from a position standpoint, I think Notre Dame is still in need of a starting left tackle, which I alluded to earlier. And I think they should probably add another defensive back Preferably safety. It sounds like Xavier Watts is going to return to Notre Dame for next season, which is obviously huge. He won the Bronco Nagurski Award for the best defensive player in the entire country, and he's a unanimous All-American. But it sounds like he is leaning towards staying. I think we'll probably get an announcement from him after the bowl game. But even even then, okay, even assuming Watts comes back, I still think they need to add a safety because they're losing D.J. Brown, and then they lost Ramon Henderson and Antonio Carter to the transfer portal. So they need depth at the position at the very least. Um, if they can get Benjamin Yurasek from Stanford at tight end, I think that would be helpful. But other than that, I, I don't know if they really need a, a tight end. Yurasek, was, he's been a productive player. Stanford always has great tight ends. Now, it is a little bit more complicated because if you add Yurasek, does that sort of lead Eli Raritan out the door because there's also Mitchell Evans? I think a lot of that has to do with Mitchell Evans' health for next season. If they think that he's going to be back healthy and ready to go for the season opener against Texas A&M, then they probably don't need anyone uh, at, at, at tight end in the transfer portal because then they would have Evans, they'd have Raritan, they'd have um, Cooper Flanagan, and then Jack Larson who's coming in. So I think they'd probably be set there. Uh, maybe they could get a running back. I think you've got to be wait and see there, though. Like, you don't need to get a running back unless one of the guys currently in the room leaves, and that could certainly happen. Uh, last year, Logan Diggs didn't decide to leave until the spring cycle, so um, you never know. Running back is a position where Dylan McCullough likes to rotate a lot, and maybe one of these guys in the room, they don't want to rotate a lot. They just want to get the ball a lot more, and they look elsewhere. So right now, I think the biggest priority is starting tackle uh, and a defensive back, get that third wide receiver, which I was talking about earlier, and I think Notre Dame would be set in the transfer portal. Uh, so far, they've landed 
uh, Riley Leonard, Chris Mitchell, Bo Collins, RJ Oban, Jordan Clark, and Mitch Jeter. So that's six, and the staff said they were looking for 10. So they're almost there. They're making uh, really good progress, but I just don't have any names that I, I know for sure Notre Dame is, is getting close to committing. All right, last one. Voluntary Joel, 41. Uh, love his questions. He asked plenty of great ones for these mailbags, and he's got another good one this week. If you could create a bowl, what would be the name, title, title sponsor, mascot, venue, slash city, and conference size? Okay. I think I'm going to call it the Woj Bowl. A little bit narcissistic to name it after myself. I'll, I'll give you that, but it sounds a little bit like the Rose Bowl, so... Um, I don't know, maybe people will think it's like a more traditional bowl just because of the name. Sponsor is easy. I want the sponsor to be Miller Lite because uh, it is the best beer. It's the best domestic beer. It's my favorite beer. And when we drink Miller Lights on game days, the Irish simply do not lose. That's a fact. Ask Luke Smith. Ask any of my friends. Miller Lights on game days. That's been a thing for years now. I don't think Miller Lite has a mascot, so maybe I'll have... Uh, Maybe I'll have that freak show, Slider, who is the mascot for my favorite baseball team, the Cleveland Guardians. I don't think he's very busy during the bowl season. The Philly Fanatic is also just a funny mascot to me, or the Big Red Blob at uh, WKU. I don't think it would have any connection to the bowl game, but it's my bowl game, so I get to pick. So that would be my mascot. For the venue, we're doing it at SoFi. That is a no-brainer for me. Uh, SoFi is only like 20 minutes away from my house here in Los Angeles, so I don't have to travel far. We know the weather is going to be good there this time of the year. It's always great. And uh, it's also like the coolest venue of all time. I have been to two games there now. I actually was at the Browns-Rams game at SoFi a couple weeks ago. The Browns lost in like typical Browns fashion. It's, It's brutal. I don't know how people emotionally invest in the Browns every single Sunday. Like, I'm a fan, but I'm not nearly as emotionally invested. But anyway, SoFi. Stadium is unbelievable. It's unlike anything I've ever been to. It's like indoor, outdoor. It's not, there's not a bad seat, good food. Yeah, I mean, it's all super expensive. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having it at SoFi. And as for the conference size, none. I, I don't want any. I want to pick. Um, is that going to work? Is that going to... Uh, be approved by those in the bowl committee? Probably not. But hey, the bowls are like on their last breath right now. So maybe they'll give me some leeway on this one. But that's it. The Woj Bowl sponsored by Miller Lite. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. And that is another week of Locked On Irish in the Books. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so now. You can also follow the show on social media. At uh, Locked On Irish is uh, the X account. At Locked On Irish Pod is the Instagram, and my personal X is at Tyler W O J C I A K. Have a great weekend, everybody. I will see you next week.